Hey everybody, welcome back. So today we have another video about the Rhythm and Time Toolkit. What I'm going to do is just make a sequencer. In the last video, link is up above, I kind of gave a quick overview of the package. This time we're just going to use it really quickly. I'm going to try to do this briefly and efficiently, and in the future videos we'll get into way more details. Alright, so let's dive into this. So I'm going to start with a clock, which produces like a phaser style clock. And I'm going to hit that with a toggle. I'm going to go over to the snippets menu here and I'm going to search for scope, which is going to give me a live dot scope that just looks exactly the way that it needs to. In terms of its range, I'm going to then add RTT dot loop, which is pretty much like subdiv, but with way more features. One of the things that it can do, if I set its range to 0 to 17, is produce a counter signal. So it's subdividing and it's counting from 1 to 16. It also produces impulses. Like if you connected your subdiv to a what? That's not the best scope to use. I'll use this one. So it's kind of Swiss Army knife for counting stuff out, subdividing, all of that. There's two parameters to really know about here, uh, steps and subdiv. There's also, by the way, a direction parameter, which I won't talk about today, but it's very cool. But steps and subdiv are the, really the main two. So subdiv sets the kind of resolution, I guess you could say. So if I set this to four, you can see that the spacing between the events over here gets much narrower. The steps is what we actually count to from the second outlet. So if I, now I'm, I have a subdivision of four, but I'm still counting to 16 right now. Right now I'll have them both be the same, but they can be separate, which is important if you want to do polymetric music. There's a video about that. You can watch that above if you want to. Um, one thing that we can do to make this music perhaps more interesting, perhaps weirder, is use an object called rtt.feel that allows us to kind of modulate this clock's slope. And I'm actually going to go into the snippets menu again to grab this one. There's a snippet for every object, which can be very useful just for getting the object kind of ready to be used with all the UI stuff that you might want. So I'll put this in place, and I'm going to move this UI stuff over here. And what this one does is wiggle, modulate a phaser. So if I draw some shape here and then I increase this depth parameter, you can see that this signal is kind of wiggling. And you can see that on the loop, we're getting these uh, this irregular interval. It's basically affecting how the signal gets subdivided. We'll hear the results of that in a little bit. So now that we have this concept of a kind of beat that's being produced by rtt.loop, the next thing that I think we'll do is generate events based on some rhythmic pattern that we create. And a way that we could do that is with rtt.euclidean. There's a many of these pattern modules in RTT that all work a similar way. And they're all compatible with uh, this abstraction that is called RTT Step Grid Viewer, which basically allows us to visualize the patterns that they are producing. So RTT.Euclidean has your classic Euclidean parameters like rotate, steps, and events. And you can see if I change the steps value here, then I'm visualizing the pattern. One thing that's good to do, you know, a lot of the time is to just couple your loop and your pattern modules steps parameters. So I can change the length of that pattern and also change the way in which I advance through that pattern with the same parameter. What I'm going to do is take this counter that I'm getting from the second outlet and patch it into the rtt.euclidean and you can now see that we're advancing through that pattern from step one to step 16. 
And again, if I change the length of this, say nine, you could see now we're doing it through nine. Let's set a value that's a little more interesting, like seven. Euclidean will also produce a few different signal types. So one is an impulse from its second outlet, and another is a counter from its first outlet. And this counter is particularly useful for situations where we want to read back a value in a list of numbers that might represent pitches or velocities or what have you. So let's do some pitches. So I'm going to use an object that's kind of purpose built for that, which is called rtt.notes. And I'm going to connect it like this, and I'm going to go and set a few attributes. So one is length, which is the number of notes in our scale. If we say 12, then we're just going to use a normal chromatic scale. We're going to say base note, which is basically going to be the first note in our scale. And then octaves is the number of octaves that we want to be able to use when we're playing it. And then I'm going to create a multi slider and I'm going to say size, I don't know, let's do something unusual, 11. And the range of that multi slider is going to be zero to one. There is a snippet for this object as well. You'll notice it has some more stuff in it because it's designed to work very nicely with Scala, which I'll talk about getting those things all working together in a video very soon. There's also a, a video on using Max's M2F object with Scala, which has some of the same features, but a lot of what I was trying to do with RTT was basically make it much easier to build a sequencer quickly. So you'll see that in RTT, there's kind of some stuff thought through that is making assumptions about what you're trying to do with them. M2F is amazing. It's definitely more flexible, I would say, than these objects, but these are a little easier to get going with kind of what you would normally want to do. So if I then attach a number box to the left outlet of our TT.notes and then I draw a pattern, you can see that we're advancing through that pattern. Now you noticed we set up a multi-slider with the range of zero to one. It's these parameters that actually control kind of the scaling that we get out of it. So one thing that's kind of cool is if you wanted to like take this pattern and now actually start to play it over, you know, three octaves, then you just hit octaves three. And now you can see that the range of these numbers is much more broad. If you want to transpose the whole pattern to say down 10 steps, then that's how you would do that. Um, and once you get this working with Scala, there's an rtt.scala object, the results can be really powerful, giving you quite a bit of control over pitch and tonality. I'll go back to 60 and 1 here. So now that we're generating events from rtt.euclidean, we're generating notes, let's actually send some MIDI. So I'm going to create an rtt.midi, uh, sorry, not MIDI out, make note. And I'm going to connect it to a MIDI out from its right outlet. And I'm going to set that to something, the destination that I want to send MIDI to. And I'm going to pass into rtt.makeNote the MIDI note value and then into the, uh, into the, the final inlet, the last inlet, I'm going to send an impulse, which we'll get from Euclidean. Now, if I go over to live and I bring up the gain on my first channel, we are making music. And I can change the timing. So that is pretty much it in terms of making a basic sequencer. One thing that we might want to do is be able to uh, add some velocity. So I'm going to use this object rtt.sequence. I'm going to steal the multi-slider from notes. 
and I'm going to set its range. So there's a high and a low attribute. And high is going to be 127. For low, let's say not zero, but like, I don't know, 36 or something. And then I'll pass the counter in to that. And then I'll draw a pattern. We can also quantize it. It's not strictly necessary. The make note kind of gets it if you send a weird MIDI value that's not actually a, a, a whole number. But we could quantize it by saying step size one. So we'll send out integers. And now if we pass that into the velocity input and go back over to live and bring it up. getting the result of that. It's kind of cool this particular instrument seems to map its uh, filter cutoff to the velocity. Ooh. Okay, one more. Let's do the note duration. That sounds great. So we'll say between, I don't know, like 10 milliseconds. Oh no, that's the top of the range. So we'll say like 500 and 10. And we'll do into the duration input here. Although it doesn't seem like this instrument particularly cares about the uh, the note, the um, gate time. Let's check it out. Sounding cool. All right, I'd say that's about enough for today. Next time we'll do more stuff. Let me know if there's anything in particular that you'd like to learn about. There's gonna be just a lot of videos on these objects. There's a lot going on in them, but hopefully this helped you get started. So I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.